Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most striking aspects in this epochal pandemic is isolation. I would try in the next 20 minutes to draw a picture of the challenging impact isolation has on patient care. So the word isolation comes from the Latin word insula, which means island. And even though we don't lock people with infectious diseases away on islands anymore, there is still the idea of physical separation that remains. Most of us had no experience with isolation before COVID-19. And at least in Europe, thinking of it a year ago, Boccaccio's De Camerone would have come to mind, where 10 persons decide to weather the plague in Florence by moving to a mansion in the countryside. In order to structure their time, each day one of them would define a topic about which everyone had to tell a story. Others of us would maybe have thought of Arthur Schopenhauer, who idealized solitude and isolation as a higher state of mind. COVID-19 in Germany, as in most other European countries, led to harsh lockdowns, changing not only our personal life, but even more the one of our patients. I remember vividly the day when getting out of my car early in the morning, I found my hospital locked by huge chains, leaving only one small entrance open for the staff. And without wanting to discuss the, necess the necessity of this step, I'm sure we all agree that this meant and still means a new dimension of suffering for our patients and their families. It's then that La Peste by Albert Camus became for, turned for many of us into sort of a personal diary, followed by a number of remarkable writings in this last year. So this is a talk on isolation and delirium. And I decided instead of citing academic papers and discussing studies on the issue, to rather draw a personal picture. So I asked our colleagues in our network, in our Netzwerk Delir, how they experienced their work ever since. One aspect is certainly the situation of personal isolation for lockdown reasons and because of fear to transmit the virus to their loved ones. Many of them didn't see their families for month and month. So I piled up statements of healthcare workers many of them wanting to stay unnamed. What you can easily see is that isolation is one of the predominating aspects of these new circumstances at work. It starts with the need of wearing PPE, which many colleagues find time consuming, impeding and strenuous. Many of my colleagues also complained or underlined the fact of isolation in their private life. None of them, though, doubted the need and necessity of sticking to these new hygiene rules in our hospital. What many of them mentioned as well 
is the fact of physical isolation behind closed doors with co-workers outside, not being part of rounds, being somehow detached in that way also causes fear for help in emergency situations takes much longer. Next aspect most of the colleagues agreed on is the new distance between them and their patients. Not only would all of them minimize physical contact, but what they feel is that the level of communication um, is much lower and less direct, less alive, because of masks and goggles or face shields. Quite a number was also concerned about the solitude of their patients being separated from their families and therefore being even more dependent on us. All of us agreed that isolating these patients is and was mandatory in order to protect staff and other patients. Yet many of us agreed that we were not sufficiently prepared, nor were our patients or their families, to tackle this unknown solitude. So this solitude affects COVID and non-COVID patients as well, delirious and non-delirious patients. For hospitals are not allowing any visitors, Staff are required to wear masks at all time. There's hardly any touch. Many of the older patients lack technological experience to set up communication with their family by video or phone calls. Cases of guardianship are often delayed. There is a language barrier that complicates the matter. And staff fatigue and burnout is evident. So I talked to my colleague and friend Petra about this. She is a respiratory tech. And she said that there's also a new distance within the team. And she sent me three pictures she took of one of our colleagues, Sebastian. Sebastian is a good looking nurse that you would always recognize by his blonde hair and his tattooed right arm. But once Sebastian gowns up in PPE, he turns into one of many non-persons. He was surprised himself when Petra showed him the pictures. Some colleagues, Petra told me, attached a printed picture from themselves on their PPE in order to make sure everybody would always recognize them. Petra herself made the same experience, colleagues mistaking her for someone else, for she has an average height, average weight and no specific ticks. And yes, it is kind of a strange experience that you have to prove who you are. Patients and colleagues told me that face shields are alienating faces partly to mirror effects, the voice being muffled. Staff complained about highly restricted visibility and audibility, and many of them feel as if they were wearing a diving bell all day long. In my hospital, most of the staff is wearing skiing goggles, which is not less challenging for the patient, for you don't recognize the person behind. It is almost impossible to tell whether the person smiles or frowns at you. And not being prepared for that, even for a non-delirious patient, this is kind of an unreal scenario. So imagine you are an 85-year-old man who just had surgical repair of his hip fracture, waking up in an isolated room for, you showed somehow, 
a patchy CT scan and um, everybody is not really sure about your COVID status. And then the physical therapist team comes in, all of them dressed up in red gowns, skiing goggles, masks, hats, and gloves. That's kind of an odd situation if you're not prepared for that. And sorting that out must be extremely challenging. Why is that so? Well, it's probably best explained with a model of predictive coding. Our perception is the sum of sensory driven analysis and top down expectations. Top down expectations are prior experience, a sensory experience that we encode. And our brain is always trying to minimize prediction error. And um, it does it can do so by updating prior beliefs into posterior beliefs which means that it either either has to change the sensory driven analysis or the conditional expectations but both of that becomes very difficult when sensory input and the condition is totally unknown and new to you. So what we can do about this is trying to optimize sensory analysis and expectational condition by creating a sort of familiar atmosphere. And, you know, there are some very easy solutions to that, like postcards, letters, pictures, this one is a five-year-old boy who, whose father was uh, in our hospital, non-COVID, but still in a weaning process, and he was not allowed to see him, so he painted this order um, telling him to breathe and working on this breathing on his own every day a little bit more. Going viral might be another very elegant solution as long as your patients are somehow familiar with um, this technology. What you see here is Andreas Falthauser, the leader of an ICU in Bavaria that got hit very hard um, by COVID-19 in the first wave. And um, they found an investor who bought 100 tablets for the hospital. And Andreas told me that for quite a number, a surprisingly high number of patients, this was the perfect solution to hook them up with their families and kind of, well, not solve, but help the problem. I guess we all agree that media did not help us in reassuring people outside our hospitals. But I guess we have to recognize that they sometimes put their fingers into wounds that are real. And isolation is such a wound. We witnessed fantastic and heroic neighborhood help in Europe. For when countries were hit by COVID-19 beyond their ICU capacities, patients were flown out to other countries with available beds. This is what happened when Alsace, a French department 200 kilometers south of us, got badly hit in the first wave. Patients went, were flown out to several German hospitals. So here comes the story of a man, we can call him Mr. X. He was transferred from Mulhouse to our hospital and successfully weaned after two weeks. Waking up from coma, he found himself in another country, surrounded by people that didn't speak his language, separated from his family with no means to get in touch with them. And even after we had overcome the language barrier and set up a communication line, 
this couple had no chance to go through this together. I stayed in touch with his wife even after the man was transferred to a rehab center in France, and it took another three weeks for his brave wife to get to see him. No doubt this was a life-saving action, but it is only afterwards that we realized how much psychological trauma and suffering these patients and their family go through. So isolation, as we see it right now, affects all patients, not only COVID patients. And that makes delirium management often very difficult. Here's a case, as we all know them, a 72-year-old man with a condition after blunt brain injury with intracranial hemorrhage five weeks ago. He had an external ventricular drainage and then shunt implantation. He then developed shunt infection and shunt was removed. He was transferred to the intermediate care in the middle of the night because of lack of beds. We found a highly agitated patient with alpha agonists and antipsychotics at the upper limit. A man married, two kids, phone or video calls, in this moment, not feasible. So our patient was awake and responsive, fighting physical restraints that were still necessary for the ventricular damage was in place, calling for help, showing very strong onirides experiences. And this is kind of a very tragic situation. After a very severe intracranial trauma, all vital functions he would need to participate in his former life were back, yet this patient wouldn't recognize his former life. So this man was able to walk, to eat, to brush his teeth, and even to write letters. But the world he found himself in had nothing to do with the world outside, as you can see in this letter. These patients are highly strenuous, we all know that, and the situation within our team was bad enough. Lack of staff, emotional drain and burnout, and visiting restrictions due to COVID-19. So we went for a team timeout and discussed the options we had. Transferral to psychiatry was not accepted within the team and also impossible because of the ventricular damage he was still having. Pharmacological sedation was not working and um, most of us felt that it was making things even worse. Mobilization and ergotherapy were in place but proved not to be sufficient to reorientate this man. So we discussed the option of uh, rooming in um, what we um, like to do in non-COVID times. And of course, it was kind of forbidden, but only kind of. And then finally decided to room his wife in. And this is what finally worked. And we managed to reorientate um, this man, bring him back to the world we all live in and could finally transfer him to normal ward. I come to an end, and I would like to state that this apical pandemic that led to an unseen isolation of all patients in hospital must be a wake-up call. And I strongly agree with this article in Australian Critical Care that now is the time to maximize and capitalize on engagement of multidisciplinary approaches within the ICU team, starting with efforts to improve 
clinician patient and patient family communication, the effects of which will last long after hospital discharge and when the pandemic is over.